Awake for the Sake of the Future, Lecture 5. Salt, Sulphur and Mercury Processes in the Inner Human Being. The Dissolution of Ancient Clairvoyance through Spiritual Observation of Nature. Dornock, January the 13th, 1923. I would like you to recall the three individuals I characterised yesterday. Giordano Bruno, Francis Bacon and Jacob Bomb because their significance for the transition from the 16th to the 17th centuries carries over into our own time. Each one struggled to understand the human being anew, to articulate the essential nature of the self, and yet at the same time they were unable to arrive at the clear insights they were seeking. This is a common characteristic of the age in which they lived, and one that now may be seen very clearly. I pointed out that although the old knowledge and wisdom about the nature of the human being had been lost, even the most earnest struggles of these prominent intellectuals of the 16th and 17th centuries could not achieve a new understanding of our essential being. In a strange, almost incomprehensible language, Jakob Bohm conveyed a yearning to understand the universe in the human being and the human being within the universe. Above all, what Bohm brought together in his understanding of the interrelatedness of the human being and the universe now illuminates today's anthroposophic knowledge of the human being during pre-earthly existence. Nevertheless, a complete and clear representation of the human being before we enter earthly life is not to be found in Bohm. He haughtily portrayed the rudiments of a pre-earthly human being, but the human being Bohm described as a soul spiritual being would have had to die in the spiritual world before descending to earthly existence. Thus Bohm was unable to fully grasp the existence of the universe in the human being and the human being in the universe. When we look at the poetic phrases of Giordano Bruno we find a person whose knowledge of the universe is painted in grand pictures. He places the human being within a majestic world view and also tries to discover the universe in the human being and the human being in the universe. But Bruno likewise fails to reach a full understanding. Giordano Bruno's mighty pictures are indeed grand and beautiful. On the one hand his pictures sweep into the vastness of infinity and on the other hand they plunge into the deepest reaches of the human soul but they remain indefinite and nebulous. Ultimately, everything that Giordano Bruno says reveals his striving to place human beings of the present within the spatial universe and to describe the nature of the cosmos as well. Even as Jacob Bohm gave an inadequate description of the pre-earthly existence of the human being, so too Giordano Bruno offered an incomplete picture of the human being living in the present on earth in relationship to space and even to the cosmos. A truly thoroughgoing view of the relationship of the human being to the cosmos in the present era would give us a picture of both the pre-earthly and the post-earthly existence of the human being, just as I presented here a short time ago in the course on philosophy, cosmology and religion. Looking once again at Francis Bacon, we see that he no longer has anything like a traditional idea of the human being. Bacon gives no evidence of older notions about human nature from ancient esoteric traditions or the old mystery wisdom. Bacon turned his glance out into the world where the senses can directly perceive and he gave human reason the task of combining observations of phenomena and sense perceptible objects to discover the laws of nature. He placed the human soul in the soul state that exists between the moment of falling asleep and its subsequent awakening. But he assigned to this state only pictures of a non-human nature. These pictures, when you take them in the logical and abstract way used by Bacon, reflect only what is external to the human being. If, however, these pictures are experienced in a living way, then they could be transformed into something that reveals the nature of human existence after death. For out of our modern knowledge of nature, it is also possible to achieve exactly what esoteric perception can establish about the nature of the human being after death. Thus, Bacon is among those who struggle to reach a new knowledge of the human being in the universe, 
and the universe in the human being at the turn of the 16th and 17th centuries. But his efforts were insufficient for the task he wished to accomplish. For Bacon, only the images or pictures remained of what had, in former times, been a living reality experienced deeply in the life of the soul. Bacon, lacking the vitality of soul experience that existed in ancient and medieval times, could no longer intensify the pictures and suffuse them with living experience. Bacon stood at the threshold of recognising the nature of life after death, but he was unable to reach beyond the threshold and grasp this knowledge. Thus we can say that drawing upon traces of old traditions, Jakob Bohm still had some knowledge about the pre-earthly existence of the human being, but it was incomplete. Giordano Bruno stood at the brink of describing the universe in a way recognisable to human beings today. He saw humanity with its life of soul on one side and humanity standing before the expanse of the entire cosmos on the other side. But Giordano Bruno defended an inadequate view of the cosmos and an equally insufficient description of the life of the soul, which for him had shrunk into a living monad. Lord Bacon shows us how the natural sciences would have to develop. Indeed, natural science based entirely on the material aspect could draw out the spark of the spiritual in matter through an unfettered approach to human knowledge. He pointed humanity in the direction of this freely won human knowledge, but assigned to it no specific content. If Bacon had sought for relevant meaning, he would have illuminated the post-earthly nature of the human being. That he was unable to do. His capacity to reach true knowledge also remained incomplete. Everything that in earlier epochs had enabled human beings to draw living knowledge from within was extinguished by the modern early period. The human being became inclined to remain empty when looking within and wanting to draw knowledge about the world out of the inner life of knowing. Human beings, one could say, had lost their connection with a living experience of knowledge. What remained was a point of view focused upon the outer world, upon an external, not directly connected with the human being. Jakob Bohm drew out of folk wisdom three principles associated with the fundamental nature of the human being, which he referred to as salt, mercury and sulphur. His words meant something very different from the meaning these words have today in the language of modern chemistry. If we try to connect Bohm's understanding of salt, mercury and sulphur with the terminology of the modern science of chemistry, we would entirely miss Bohm's insights. These words are used in another way. Why did Bohm use this terminology? What did these words mean in the context of the traditional folk wisdom that was the source of the terms used by Bohm? This is important because when Bohm spoke about salt, mercury and sulphur with respect to the human being, he meant something concrete and real. When we speak about the life of the soul today, we often speak in abstract terms, for what once was a real living experience has disappeared from our conscious awareness and concepts. Even Jakob Bohm was able to collect only the last crumbs of what was once a reality. External nature perceivable through the senses and accessible to human powers of reasoning, was spread out before the human being in the 17th century. We have learned about processes in nature and built upon this expanding knowledge until today we know a great deal about nature. We can also learn about the nature of the human being through outer observation. When we try to understand human nature by external observation alone, however without realising it, we build up concepts upon human physicality without examining whether the concepts correspond to the actual physical nature of the human being. When we take processes in nature perceived through our senses and apply these processes to the living human body, we create only a phantom human physicality. This approach cannot reveal what occurs beneath the skin of the human being. Similarly, when we speak about the human being in terms of thinking, feeling and willing, these expressions too are abstractions, shadow thought images, which are supposed to be filled out by our inner experiences. When our inner experiences are merely mirror images of external nature, 
we no longer have any notion of how the soul spiritual aspect penetrates human physicality. Nor do we have any understanding of what once was passed on as remnants of ancient esoteric knowledge. What does anthroposophic spiritual science say about this? Let us consider our physicality with respect to internal processes that occur simultaneously with sense perceptions. Take, for example, the process of metabolism that sustains our living physical organism. We see that metabolism coincides with sense perceptions. When we eat, we physically assimilate our food. At the same time, we also taste its flavours. Thus, our perception of flavour is mixed together with a process in which a substance from nature is assimilated into our physicality. In the metabolic process, perceiving the flavours of the food we eat accompanies the nourishment of our organism. Tasting food is the first step in the digestive process. Then the physical elements in the food are dissolved into the fluids that are present in the human organism. Plants take matter out of lifeless nature and transform it into another form. The basic form for matter in lifeless nature is crystalline. Matter that does not appear to be in crystalline form and seems to lack any form such as dust and other such matter is actually made up of shattered crystals. Plants take matter out of crystallised, lifeless nature and reconstitute it in a form that they can assimilate. Likewise, the animal takes plants into its metabolic processes and changes them into a form it can use. Thus we can say that in nature everything has its specific form. When the human being takes in matter for nutrition, the substance is dissolved and reconstituted. This is the basic nature of human metabolism. The human corporality dissolves the forms that exist in nature. We transform nature's elements into liquid or liquid forms. But even as we dissolve what we eat into a fluid state, we also inwardly reconstitute these original forms that were broken down in the metabolic process. We recreate these original forms when we eat salt, we dissolve it in the fluids of our organism, but then we form within us what the salt once was. When we eat a plant, we dissolve the substance of the plant into fluids, but inwardly we reconstitute it again. However, we do not recreate it in a fluid form. We reconstitute it within the etheric body of the human being. If you were to imagine yourself living in ancient times, you would see yourself as a human being taking salt into your body. You would dissolve it and reconfigure it again in your etheric body. During those ancient epochs you would have perceived the entire process, that is, you would experience the form of salt in your thoughts. You would eat the salt, dissolve it in your physicality, the salt crystal would exist in your etheric body, and you would know that the salt had the form of a crystal. This you would have perceived inwardly, and just as you experience the process of metabolism within yourself, you also could experience nature inwardly. Cosmic thoughts became your thoughts. What you experienced as an imagination, as a dreamlike imagination, would be represented inwardly as etherically reconstructed forms, which were also cosmic forms. Then the time came when human beings lost the ability to inwardly experience the processes of physical dissolution and etheric reconstitution. Increasingly, we look for explanations within nature itself. No longer could we inwardly experience that salt has the form of a hexahedron. We try to discover the form of a salt crystal by investigating outwardly visible nature. We became severed from inner perception and more firmly connected to outer physicality. This radical shift away from inwardly perceiving cosmic thoughts through perceptions generated in one's etheric body was completed by the beginning of the 15th century and it increased in its intensity until it reached its heights in the time in which Giordano Bruno, Jakob Bohm and Francis Bacon lived. Jakob Bohm still could grasp the crumbs of folk wisdom which spoke to him in the following way. The human being dissolves everything that is consumed of outer matter. It is a process similar to dissolving salt in water. We carry this water within our life fluids. 
Everything material that nourishes the human being is salt. It dissolves itself. Thus the cosmic thoughts of salt find expression in reality on the earth and the human being reconstitutes these cosmic thoughts within the etheric body. That is the nature of the salt process. Jakob Bohm articulated what in ancient times was perceived and recognised through inner experience. If it were not for anthroposophic insight today, it would not be possible to unlock the meaning of Jakob Bohm's halting expressions. Without anthroposophic insight, all manner of nebulous or mystical interpretations can be attributed to Bohm. It is clear that Jakob Bohm brought together the process of thinking through which the human being imagined the cosmos in pictures and the process by which thought is first dissolved in the physical body and then is subsequently reconstituted in the etheric body. That represented the salt process as Bohm understood it. Sometimes it is almost moving to see that some people today read Jakob Bohm's explanation of the salt process and think they understand what he said. In fact, they do not grasp his words at all and only reveal their own arrogance by saying so. They hold their noses high in the air and say that they have read Jakob Bohm and know that he brings us an unbelievably deep wisdom. But these interpretations do not contain any element of living wisdom. If it were not for the arrogance of these people, we might be moved by the regard they claim to have for Jakob Bohm. But they act as if they understand something that Bohm himself did not fully understand, for he struggled to express mere traces of insight that had passed into folk wisdom. Bohm himself did not fully understand the true significance of the process he tried to describe. Bohm pointed us in the direction of an entirely different science and wisdom that existed in ancient times, wisdom that was experienced by the human being as self-perception of processes in one's own etheric body, which inwardly reconstituted cosmic thoughts. Ancient people recognised that the cosmos embodied the process of crystallisation on Earth and understood that this process echoed cosmic thoughts. They recreated the process of crystallisation within the etheric body and accompanied the process knowingly. This was inherent in ancient knowledge, but in the course of human history it eventually disappeared. Imagine that you yourself were present during an ancient initiation ceremony and listen to the description being given to a new initiate out of the cosmic all. With soul spiritual sensitivity, you would listen to the words being spoken. Everywhere in the cosmic all, cosmic thoughts are at work. The Logos is at work. Observe crystallization on the earth. Crystallizations are the manifestation of individual words within the cosmic word. The sense of taste is just one of many senses. What the human being hears and sees may be treated in the same way that salt in its etheric form may be physically perceived. The human being takes in through human physicality what is embodied in the salts, reconstitutes its cosmic form in the etheric body and experiences the entire process consciously within. The cosmic thoughts repeat themselves within human thoughts Thus the human being recognises the cosmos in the human being and the human being in the cosmos. With extraordinary intuitive perception, the ancient initiate could experience with concrete intensity this dreamlike and visionary understanding of both the cosmos and the human being. During the high middle ages, this ancient knowledge disappeared behind a logical wisdom that was very significant but had nevertheless withered within the framework of scholasticism. The ancient knowledge trickled down and became folk wisdom. What formerly had been an elevated cosmic and humanistic wisdom was reduced to folk sayings repeated by the common people who understood very little of its substance but still felt that at one time it must have contained something of enormous value. Jakob Bohm lived among the common people, absorbed this folk wisdom and through his own strenuous effort brought it alive within himself. He was able to say more about the remnants of the ancient wisdom than the common people, and yet he too could express it only in a faltering way. In Giordano Bruno there lived nothing more than a general feeling that humanity had to recognise both the cosmos and the human being. 
but he lacked the capacity to say. Cosmic thoughts exist and the cosmic word incorporates itself in crystals. Human beings assimilate cosmic thoughts in that they perceive the sort that dissolves in the human physicality and then reconstitute the forms of the sort within the etheric body. Thus the human being experiences the concrete aspects of the many faceted, faceted cosmos and creates concrete thoughts within the human being from which sprouts an etheric inner world as rich as the one the cosmos emits in the cosmic all. Cosmic thought and human thought melted together for Giordano Bruno and became a general description of the cosmos sweeping outward into infinity but in a way that was entirely abstract. And what lived within the human being as the recreation of the cosmos melted together with a description of a living, indivisible entity, a monad, which amounted to nothing more than an elaborated point. What I've described to you was knowledge for the sages of the ancient mysteries. It was their science. But in addition to the fact that these sages of old could extract such a science out of their dreamlike methods, they also had the capacity to form real connections with the spiritual beings of the cosmos. Just as we today enter consciously into a relationship with another person, so it was that formerly these sages established connections with the spiritual beings of the cosmos. From these spiritual beings, they learned about another singular capacity of the human being. They learned from these spiritual beings that only the human being is capable of creating something in the etheric body whereby the human being inwardly is a replica of the cosmos, a smaller cosmos, a microcosm cosm indeed, an etheric rebirth of the macrocosm. And just as these sages had inwardly replicated the cosmos in the etheric body, it was also possible for them to gradually extinguish the microcosm as the element of air was drawn into the physical body and expelled again during breathing. Thus, the human being could learn how the universe was reborn inwardly in various forms and could also experience inwardly these different forms of the universe. In ancient times, out of one's inner living fluidity, the etheric of the entire cosmos was evident. That was an aspect of the ancient occult vision. But it remains an actual process as well. This same process is present in humanity today, although we cannot inwardly experience it. The spiritual beings who entrusted ancient sages with this knowledge pointed out to them that in addition to perceiving their inner life fluidity, water, out of which the microcosm was born, they also perceived the life air, which we take in as breath and then spread throughout our entire organism. What thus has been spread throughout the human organism is poured over the entire microcosm, causing the originally clear etheric forms to become indistinct. The wonderfully formed etheric microcosm begins to become less distinct because the flow of the breath begins to interfere with or obscure the etheric forms. What had been many forms became a single one. The human astral aspect lives within the air just as the human etheric aspect lives in the watery element. The astral human being lives in the airy element and by breaking up the etheric faults and transforming the etheric faults into human capacity and strength, the human will is born out of the astral aspect inherent in the life air. The powers of growth accompany the birth of the will, for they are closely related to the will. What I have just described is not equivalent to our modern use of the word will as an abstraction. Here we have a concrete process. The astral seizes the air forming process and spreads it out over the etheric fluidity. This process presents itself outwardly in nature when something is burned. In earlier epochs, burning was associated with the sulfur process. What was experienced in the soul as the human will was regarded as a manifestation of the sulfur process. In previous eras, human beings did not use the abstract word thinking for something that arose in the mind in pictorial form. Rather, when people who were truly knowledgeable spoke of thinking, they referred to the salt process. Nor did they speak in an abstract way about the will. Rather, they referred to the astral forces penetrating the airy element in the human being and to the sulphur process in which the observable will has its origin. 
They pointed out that the balance between the two processes for the two opposite processes was achieved through the mercury process, which is both fluid and formed. The mercury process moves back and forth between the etheric and the astral, between the formative capacities of water and air. Abstract ideas which the scholastics taught and modern sciences assimilated did not exist for the ancient thinkers. If thinkers in ancient times had been confronted with our concepts of thinking, feeling and willing, they would have felt like a frog that found itself in a jar pumped empty of air. That is how it would have seemed if an ancient thinker had come across our abstract ideas. They would have thought, this manner of thinking does not allow for a soul-filled life. In such an atmosphere one cannot breathe soul-permeated air. For them it would have seemed like an empty void. They did not speak of an abstract thinking process or an abstract will process. Instead they spoke of a salt process and a sulphur process and meant by this something that was soul spiritual on the one hand and something material etheric on the other. For them this was a unity and they perceived the cosmic order as one in which the soul worked everywhere in physicality and the physical was everywhere permeated by soul. Writings from the Middle Ages and even those from the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries were still influenced by a remnant of an ancient perspective that was filled with substance and knowledge based upon inwardly living experience. This knowledge had died out by the time Giordano Bruno, Jacob Bohm and Francis Bacon lived. Ideas had become abstract ideas rather than living ones. Human beings no longer looked within themselves for knowledge, rather they looked outward into nature. I must say to you that the ancient thinkers would have looked at our ideas no differently than a frog grasping for air in a vacuum. But we ourselves are capable of understanding these ideas. When people today speak about thinking, feeling and willing, they do not think that these processes are mirror images drawn from external nature which also happen to occur in human beings. Nonetheless, in our modern era we can achieve something that the ancients could not fully understand. One is able now, out of one's own autonomous capacities, to draw knowledge out of one's own self. But in the time between the 15th century and our present day, Human beings could no longer arrive at knowledge simply by looking within their inner being. Rather, one looked outward into nature from which one would draw abstract ideas. But now these abstract ideas can be intensified, can once again receive substance, because they can again be experienced in a living way. It is true that this human capacity is still in its beginning stages, but this beginning can also lead to anthroposophic spirit knowledge. All of these processes that I have referred to, the salt process and the sulphur process for example, are processes that do not take place outwardly in nature. They are processes that we can recognise only in our inner being. In outer nature they do not take place. However, there does occur something in external nature that is related to the contrast between processes in a corpse and processes that occur in a living person. If the chemistry we are familiar with today were to speak of the sulphur and salt processes that Jakob Bohm could still acquire out of folk wisdom, it would characterise what occurs in a corpse rather than what occurs within a living human being. Today's chemistry is completely dead, whereas the perceptions of the ancients were inwardly alive. The human being formally saw into a world that was different from the one surrounding earthly humanity. With the help of self-generated understanding, the human being had the capacity to see something that was not in the environment surrounding the human being on earth, but something that belonged to another world. When a human being, living in an earlier era, achieved an understanding of these salt and sulphur processes, that individual could see into the pre-earthly life of humanity. For earthly life is differentiated from pre-earthly life in that the living sulphur and salt processes that are visible now in our outer world of the senses appear as if they were dead. What we perceive between birth and death through our senses are in fact the living sulphur and salt processes that we experienced in pre-earthly existence. That is the processes that Jakob Bohm dimly understood but expressed with difficulty actually 
correspond to what one can perceive in pre-earthly existence. Jakob Bohm did not speak about pre-earthly existence because he did not have a clear understanding of its reality and could express what he grasped only in faltering words. The capacity of the human being to look into pre-earthly existence had been lost. Moreover, the connection humanity had with the spiritual beings of the cosmos, which could help us to see in the sulfur process the reality of post-earthly existence, had been severed. The entire constitution of the human soul is different now from what it was in ancient times, and Giordano Bruno, Jacob Bohm and Francis Bacon all lived during the time of this transformation of the soul. Yesterday I mentioned the fact that today people no longer have any idea how differently human beings in ancient times saw themselves in relation to the world. In our day people can barely appreciate accounts that date back further than the relatively recent past. I have pointed out that the grandiose notion of the origin of Merlin is an example of this. We can also look at other examples. In Dornoch we have performed the Oberfer plays several times. But the story of the visit of the three kings to the Jesus child can also be found in the much earlier Germanic lay of the Heliand. This narrative poem originated in Central Europe and dates back to the early medieval era, that is the 9th century CE. There we notice something very remarkable, something quite unusual is attached to the visit of the three kings from the east. The three kings in the Heliand account come from a place and a people that were entirely different from the people living at the time that the story was being told. That is, the kings had come from the era at the very beginning of our time reckoning, and they were the descendants of people who were immensely wiser than the people to whom they appeared in the story. The free kings said that they had descended from an ancestor who had lived in a distant past, when a few people still had the power to speak with the gods. When their forefather approached death, he assembled all of the members of his vast family and told them what his God had revealed to him. There would come a time when a world king would appear and this event would be accompanied by the appearance of a star. If we look for other sources for this tradition, we find mention of Balaam, the son of Beor, in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. The three kings from the east may have been referring to Balaam, for the scriptures relate that he conversed with his God and ordered his entire life according to these exchanges. Furthermore, in the time in which the Hiliand originated in Central Europe, there still lived a dim recollection of human beings who once spoke with their gods. A real concept of this occurrence lived within human beings during the 9th century. Thus we once again have seen how people in earlier epochs still experienced a living world whereas at the present time we have moved away from this reality. You can see what a dramatic change has occurred in the souls of human beings. At one time the human being knew that individuals had occult knowledge, even if it was in a dreamlike form. At an earlier point humanity looked within and beheld processes such as the sulphur and the salt process. Through their occult capacity they were able to perceive pre-earthly existence. Certain people who wanted humanity to move backward rather than forward and were themselves initiated to a certain degree foresaw that this capacity to see into pre-earthly existence would be lost and that one day human beings would no longer be able to draw out of themselves any knowledge of pre-earthly life. Thus it was introduced into the canon of church doctrine that there is no pre-earthly existence whatsoever that the human soul is created at the time of physical conception. The fact of pre-earthly existence was dogmatically vowed in darkness. That was the first step, the first stage by which humanity on earth was led into ignorance of a fundamental aspect of the human being. A piece of one's essential humanity was taken away, the knowledge of the human being's pre-earthly existence. Jakob Bohm, Giordano Bruno and Francis Bacon lived during the time in which the knowledge of pre-earthly life was still conceived. They lived when it was not yet possible to grasp what they should have been able to discover through the spiritual observation of the outer world. The human being soon would be able to find in the outer world what could no longer be found in one's inner being. 
Again, there were initiates who wanted to lead humanity backward rather than forward, initiates who did not want to allow this new form of insight, which is the opposite of the ancient esoteric knowledge, to flourish. They tried through a dogmatic approach to substitute a belief in the afterlife for the new knowledge. And thus, in the time in which Giordano Bruno was active, an intervention came to suppress the knowledge of pre-earthly human existence and to suffocate as well the knowledge of human existence beyond earthly existence. Giordano Bruno struggled with great determination to gain knowledge and he surpassed the efforts of both Jacob Bohm and Francis Bacon. Bruno stood as if he were a man of the present, but he just could not reformulate what was given him out of the Dominican wisdom he had received to create instead a real cosmic perspective. He could only express poetically what had come to him in an uncertain way of a true world view. And yet the knowledge Giordano Bruno portrayed in a nebulous form did give birth to a new understanding of the cosmos revealed in the human being and the human being revealed in the cosmos. This did not come out of a renewal of an older esotericism, rather it arose out of the freely generated spiritual activity that can be acquired by all human beings. Thus I've characterized for you what had to come about in the course of human development and today the human being stands before the fact that the will to allow this new knowledge to arise is despised and deeply hated by a great many human beings who are enemies of this possibility. This can also be grasped from a historical perspective. It helps us to understand how the fierce opposition to an anthroposophical worldview has come out of the very depths of its active opponents.